Good evening. Tonight, residents of Agbo in Delta State thrown into mourning following a gas explosion in the area which claimed the lives of four people and left 11 others with severe burns. President Buhari pledges $100 million in renewed efforts by ECOWAS leaders to tackle insecurity in the sub-region at the virtual 58th Ordinary Session. For the third time, the Nigerian army fails to appear before the Lagos State Judicial Panel to explain its role in the shooting of Vensar's protesters at the Lekki Toll Gate on October 20, 2020. An Italian Prime Minister warns he will take legal action against Pfizer and AstraZeneca over delay in the supply of coronavirus vaccines. Plus, you'll see business and sports. On business news tonight, Central Bank to borrow exporters from bank services in the country for failure to repatriate export proceeds. And on sports news tonight, Rivers United progress in the CAF Confederation Cup after beating South Africa's Bloemfontein Celtics 5-0 on aggregate to reach the final playoff round. It occurred in the later hours of yesterday, but by the time the dust settled today, four people had lost their lives, throwing residents of Agbo in Delta State into mourning. It was the aftermath of a gas explosion that also left 11 others severely burnt, as well as buildings and farmlands destroyed. Meanwhile, Delta State Governor Ifanyo Koa has promised to liaise with the state lawmakers to enact laws that will regulate and regularize the siting of gas stations within residential areas in the state. He made the pledge while visiting some of the victims in the hospitals where they are receiving treatment. This eyewitness video shows the moment a gas plant exploded in Delta State. A number of residents are affected, suffering various degrees of burns, and they seek medical attention, which appears insufficient. People are dying. Look at, look at somebody I have in my car too. Look at what is what is happening. Look at my look at my car too. Jeez, they are telling me they are telling me they don't have equipment. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Hours after the unfortunate incident, a large crowd still gathers at the scene on the Agbo Bini Highway. Truck, gas tank, fire extinguishers and other equipment from the plant are completely razed by the fire. Residents feel the incidents could have been effectively contained if they had a functional fire station in the locality. The state government, the federal government should work assiduously to make sure that we have a workable fire service. Because if you say we have a very formidable fire service, this thing would have quenched. The fires dismayed us at the time of this report. Governor Kwa is here to ascertain the extent of damage done. The impact of the explosion is felt as far as 500 meters away from the epicenter. Homes, farmlands are destroyed to a significant extent. The governor makes his way through the agitated crowd to the homes of some of the victims of the explosion to commiserate with them. It's a sad tale. Beyond the devastation, four persons had died and several others injured. The state chapter of the Red Cross Society is also on the ground to help evacuate the corpses. The governor's next port of call is the Central Hospital Agbo. A visibly disturbed Governor Koa pledges to ensure that laws are enacted to regulate the siting of gas plants in the state. It's a, it's a situation. We even have some level of... Uh, that's why, how do I put it now? That the place was not very immediately within a densely populated area. Because if it was, the damage would just have been much more. I'm aware that we have some of these uh, facilities uh, in even in more densely populated areas. And I was just talking with my house member that I'm going to speak to the House of Assembly. 
we have to do an immediate legislation that will not allow such be anymore. As against complaints of slow response to the incident, Governor Kwa expresses satisfaction with how the medical personnel handled the situation by first applying first aid to the victims before transferring them to UBTH Benin and Federal Medical Center, Asaba. Away from Delta, amid the persistent security challenges in the ECOWAS sub-region, President Muhammadu Buhari is committing a fresh $100 million to combat the situation. At the end of the virtual 58th ordinary session of the Authority of Heads of State and Government of ECOWAS today, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Jeffrey Unyama, said that the sum of $20 million is to be released for the implementation of the ECOWAS Action Plan on the fight against terrorism. $80 million dollars will equally be dispersed towards the fight against terrorism and banditry in Nigeria's northeast and northwestern regions. Our correspondent Gloria Umezioke reports. The 58th Ordinary Session of the Authority of Heads of State and Government of the Economic Community of West Africa holds virtually owing to the COVID-19 pandemic. Former President Goodluck Jonathan also joined other leaders of member states to discuss issues of regional security as Nigeria pledged to fulfill her financial commitments towards the fight against terrorism. We have already directed the immediate remittance of the sum of 20 million US dollars pledged by Nigeria to the pool account of the ECOWAS Action Plan to Fight Terrorism, while the sum of 80 million dollars is to be disbursed for the fight against terrorism in the northeast and banditry in the northwest of Nigeria for the year 2020. We are also committed to meeting our obligations for the remaining period of the action plan. The meeting, which lasted for about six hours, equally focused on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the economy of member states. It is important for the region to evolve effective measures and avoid total lockdown at this critical time that our economies are gradually recovering from the first wave of the pandemic. The economic challenges that our region faces because of the pandemic will no doubt manifest this year, 2021. As you are all aware, the major source of income for ECOWAS is the community levy, which will significantly reduce because of the effect of COVID-19 pandemic on our economies. I call on all member states to ensure that we prioritize the acquisition of the vaccines for our citizens, while at the same time increasing efforts to develop our own vaccines so that we can build herd immunity against the COVID-19 pandemic in West Africa. In view of the financial constraints caused by the pandemic, President Mohamed Buhari is proposing that the number of representatives that make up the management team of the ECOWAS Commission be scaled down owing to financial difficulties within the sub-region. From the presidential villa, Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. The Nigerian Correctional Service, NCS, has described as false claims by the Islamic movement in Nigeria that the wife of the leader of the movement, Sheikh Ibrahim El Zaki, has been infected with coronavirus while in detention at its facility in Kaduna. The service explains in a statement that there is no report of any COVID-19 infection in any of its facilities, as all inmates are safe and protected from the virus. It states that once the pandemic was officially reported in Nigeria in February 2020, the Kajuna command of the service locked down all the custodial centers and put admission of new inmates on hold as centrally instructed. According to the NCS, admission of new inmates was lifted in June 2020 when all necessary measures to prevent the disease from spreading to the custodial centers had been put in place. It adds that effective measures are in place to facilitate compliance with the COVID-19 protocols as well as construction of isolation centers in designated areas for exceptional cases. 
And apart from undermining the health systems of most countries, the raging coronavirus pandemic has also exposed the vulnerability of countries which depend on importation to meet their pharmaceutical needs. Like many other African countries, Nigeria falls in the category of nations with very minimal pharmaceutical sufficiency as the country depends largely on the importation of her products from China, the US and India. Our next report looks at what can be done to upscale local production of pharmaceutical products in the country. The Nigeria Institute of Medical Research in Lagos and the Nigeria Institute for Pharmaceutical Research and Development are two government institutions established to help scale up local production of essential medicines in Nigeria, including vaccines. Experts say the two institutions ought to position Nigeria in a strategic advantage position in Africa's growing pharmaceutical markets. According to the 2017 African Pharmaceutical Market Report, the value of the continent's pharmaceutical market was $28.56 billion. It is projected to reach $70 billion by the year 2030. However, Nigeria appears not ready to have its share in this huge market as experts complain of poor funding for research and a lack of data as hampering the country's prospects. Nigeria is blessed with thousands of plants that have potential to help cure diseases. We need to invest in research and development in Nigeria. And in Nigeria, if you're talking about pharmaceutical and phytomedicinal research and development, not just in Nigeria, in the whole of Africa, nobody has the kind of capacity that NIPRID had, that has. Over and over again, we've demonstrated it. The huge amount of knowledge that is trapped in this country, if we're able to open them up, we won't be looking for any outside drug. And uh, more so, we don't have data. We don't really have data. We have you know, data here and there, but there's no coordinated data. Nigeria spent about $1.45 billion to import pharmaceutical products in 2019 alone. The country depends on China, the US, India, and the United Kingdom for most of the pharmaceutical needs. But the outbreak of COVID-19 and its effect on the importation of pharmaceutical products appears to be making the government have a rethink. On Thursday, January 21st, the federal government inaugurated the committee to fast-track research and validation of phytomedicines produced in Nigeria, a move that some practitioners believe will change the narrative. Nigerians need to know that we, we have to believe in our own. Just like what the, the Honorable Speaker said, uh, Honorable, uh, Honorable Minister said, that it is high time we, we stop uh, using others and let us use our own. Because for me, whether you like it or not, 80% of people in the, uh, in the rural areas are using about medicine. Globally, the pharmaceutical market is experiencing a significant growth as it hit $1.25 trillion in 2019. However, the outbreak of coronavirus and its effects on medical supplies globally emphasizes the need for countries to look inwards and try to limit the importation of pharmaceutical products. Away from COVID matters, as the political atmosphere gathers steam towards the 2023 general elections, party faithful within the All Progressives Congress in Ibuin State have been asked to regard patriotism to the state above other interests. Governor David Omahi said this during a meeting of APC members in Ibakaliki, the state capital, promising that equal opportunity will be extended to those seeking elective offices. We have to know that patriotism so the state is number one. The state is a common denominator. That's the reducer. That's where all of us come together before anything. And we make all kinds of permutation and combination in our quest for leadership, in our quest for election. But one thing we do not accommodate is the factor of God, God's factor. I always believe that we are all running our different destinies. 
if you want to help yourself God will allow you to help yourself but if you want God to help you you have to have faith in God and do things rightly and so in this our next level everybody must be given equal opportunity equal opportunity <laughs> In part two after the break, for the third time, the Nigerian army fails to appear before the Lagos State Judicial Panel to explain its role in the Leki Togate shooting. Plus, bandits kill six people, leaving eight others injured in a fresh attack on communities in two local government areas in Kaduna State. Please join us again. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on Channels Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Residents of Agbo in Delta State thrown into mourning following gas explosion in the area, which claimed the lives of four people and left 11 others with severe burns. President Buhari, $100 million in a renewed effort by ECOWAS leaders to tackle insecurity in the sub-region at their virtual 58th ordinary session. For the third time, the Nigerian army fails to appear before the Lagos State Judicial Panel to explain its role in the shooting of NSAR's protesters at the Lekki toll gate on October 20, 2020. An Italian Prime Minister warns he will take legal action against Pfizer and AstraZeneca over delay in the supply of coronavirus vaccines. The Nigerian army has again failed to appear before the Lagos State Judicial Panel on restitution for victims of SARS and other related matters. It's the third time they failed to honor the summons of the panel for officers involved in the shooting to explain what happened at the Leki toll gate on the 20th of October last year. At today's proceedings, counsel to the panel, Mr. Jonathan Ugusoya, confirmed that summons were sent to three army officers. Our judiciary correspondent, Shola Shirley, reports. The, order of, uh, my Lord, lead at the, last date. the Lagos State Judicial Panel on Restitution for Victims of SARS and Other Related Matters today listed eight cases for hearing. Of the eight, five required the presence of the Nigerian army. But again, the army was absent, neither were they represented by counsel. The counsel to the panel, Jonathan Ogunsoya, confirmed that summons were sent to Colonel Bello, who led the battalion to the Lekki toll gate on the 20th of October 2020. To Major General Godwin Umelo, the General Officer Commanding 81 Division, Lagos and Ogun, and to Brigadier General Francis Omata of the Obalinde Barracks. Counsel to some victims of SARS, additional Gulano, has asked the panel to summon the counsel on record for the Nigerian Army, Akinloluke in the SAN, to respond to the summons and the failure of the Army officers to appear. If the military is, is judging, the gentleman lawyer must not be allowed to go. He should come back before this panel. I'm strongly urging the panel to look in that direction and query his explanation. If you say indeed that you are instructed to appear in particular one person, why fight for all this other that people? Other counsel appearing before the panel also made their contributions. He, as counsel, owes a duty to come before the panel if for any reason he is no longer proceeding in that specific one. I would suggest you know that every petition that I mentioned in the global should be bonded together and sent on their program so that they can come if they have anything to say regarding this petition, the allegations in these petitions. In her ruling, the chairman of the panel, Justice Doris Okuobi, made the following orders. 
It is hereby ordered that the Council for the Panel shall issue a letter to Leonard Silk, Mr. ATK, and the Senior Advocate of Nigeria, to appear before the panel at the next adjourned date to explain why he will not conclude the case of the Nigerian Army. I implore the military authority to appear and present their defense so that no issue of denial of fear hearing will arise when the panel's report is submitted to government. All matters involving the Nigerian army were then adjourned till the 30th of January 2021. Shola Shueli, Channels Television News. And to security, where fresh attacks by suspected bandits in Kaduna State has resulted in the death of at least six people, with eight others injured in Giwa and Chikun local government areas of the state. The State Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs, Mr. Samuel Arwan, explains that four of the six persons were killed in Chikun local government council, while two others were murdered in Giwa. According to him, the gunmen attacked Maskoro community of Kakao Ward and Akunakuo of Gwagwada Ward, both in Chikun local government area, where they killed two people, while two others, Haranadogo and Danjuma Jagaba, were killed at Akonkuo in similar attacks. In a separate incident in Hain Inji and Kidondo towns in Gewaloku government area, the attackers also killed one Yahuza Jenodu in a bid to dispossess him of his motorcycle. The bandits injured nine persons at Yareke Galadimawa, also in Gewaloku government area, while one of the victims, Kabiru Lado, eventually died as he was being rushed to hospital. Elsewhere, in its bid to tackle cross-border crimes in Ogun State, the Nigeria Immigration Service, NIS, has commissioned another forward operation base in a border town in Yewa North, the local government area of the state. The Controller General of the NIS, Mr. Mohamed Babandide, who led a team to the base, gave assurances that technology will be deployed to ensure effective surveillance activities along the nation's borders. For the state governments, the state requires a special status regarding control and administration of border posts to strengthen security. Ogun State in southwest Nigeria is one of the states that share border with Benin Republic at Ijiroko town in Ikokia local government area. The area is characterized by the menace of smuggling, human trafficking, illegal migration and other cross-border crimes because of the porosity of the border. To address these challenges, a new forward operation base has been established in Ilashe to improve the security of the area. The Controller General of the Nigeria Immigration Service, Mohamed Babandidi, and other officials are on ground to commission the facility alongside other security agencies. First, he moves to carry out a quick inspection. The Controller General warns against human rights violation and extortion by the officers while promising the deployment of technology for effective border monitoring. Mr. President, above all, has approved e-border, which will start working this year. It means we'll start seeing what is happening in our land borders real-time online and communicate and share with other law enforcement real-time online. For the use of our officers so that they can make good use of it to serve Nigeria better. Next, he moves on to the business of the day. Representing the state governor, the Commissioner for Culture and Tourism is demanding a special status for the vast and strategic border communities in the state to improve security. In fact, Ogun State deserves a special status in terms of consideration for border control and administration. The security at the international border in our dear state is very dear to Nigeria and, of course, to the West Africa religion. 
the establishment of the new facility, which is the second forward operations base in Ogun State, is expected to strengthen national security at the borders and adequately tackle human trafficking, smuggling, and other nefarious activities. Meanwhile, in Oyo State, the police command says it is investigating the crisis that erupted yesterday between Igongo youths and Fulani herdsmen in the state capital. The police public relations officer in the state command, Ms. Egbenga Fadei, told Channels Television that there are no record of any fatality from the violence, but said that some houses at the Fulani settlements were burned along with three vehicles. He also said that one policeman was injured in the conflict. Conflict. Trouble began after a youth leader from the Okogun axis of the state, Sunday Adeyemo, also known as Iboho, went with his supporters to warn the Fulani community that banditry, kidnapping and killings of people in the area would no longer be tolerated. But violence was reported to have erupted between the youths in the area and the Fulani community after the team led by Iboho had departed Igongo. Asked about the reported order to arrest Igboho, the police spokesman declined comment on the said directive. Over the years, insecurity has been a major concern in the nation's South-South region due to years of militancy and agitation for resource control by some restive youths in the area. The introduction of the Presidential Amnesty Program for Repentant Militants quelled the scourge of militancy and youth restiveness, but other criminal activities such as kidnapping and armed robbery still bedevil the region. This next report takes a look at the present security arrangement in the oil-rich region. When security issues concerning the oil-rich south-south region of Nigeria is being discussed, thoughts of armed-bearing youths chanting war songs is what readily comes to mind. With the introduction of the presidential amnesty program, youth restiveness and militancy have greatly reduced. We visited the six states that make up the South-South region to find out the security challenges experienced and measures put in place by various political and security leaders in the region. This is Uyo in Akwaibom state, where residents say, apart from occasional security infractions in some parts of the state, they enjoy considerable level of safety of lives and property across the state. As we are talking to you right now, Normality have returned back because people can walk on the street. Those are doing petty business and return back late and uh, home late at night. They are doing well than before. The investment of His Excellency the Governor, Mr. Dom Emmanuel, in security is humongous. He see it takes personal interest in the running of security. In Cross River State, the security situation in the state recently got a boost following the launch of the state security outfit codenamed Operation Akpako, which draws its personnel from the Army, Navy, Air Force and Civil Defense. Prior to the launch of Operation Akpako, the state experienced several cases of kidnapping. Any single citizen who comes on a trade ban, a kidnapper, the nearest neighbor just needs to notify a particular number. Our investigation revealed that in Delta State, kidnapping and banditry, which used to be on the increase, is being curbed. Talking about security situation in Asaba or Delta generally, I think it's relatively okay compared to what it used to be. I know every December there's always this urge for people to go stealing and robbing the roads, but it's not like that this time. I think we'll have a relative peace now. The launch of Operation Delta Org, a state government funded security outfit, has restored peace in the state. The hijack of the NSAS protest in October 2020 dealt a major blow to the security architecture of Edo State. After the NSAS, the rot of it was a robbery. Even within the end, during the NSAS, the Nigerian maximum prison in Oko here in Benin City, Edo State, and other uh, correctional uh, facility here in Sapala Road was actually affected, where 
the hoodlums break through the jail, free the inmates there, and they took to the street. And today that's where, why we have in a greater number armed robbery, kidnapping, and other offenses. Aside efforts made by individual state governors and their security teams, the governor of Bayelsa State revealed that the South-South governors have already begun plans to launch a regional security outfit that will further improve security in the region. We uh, agreed that uh, the BRICS Commission uh, will have to come back on stream and uh, they were to contact uh, various uh, security chiefs uh, in our different states who will also come together and uh, come up, bring up something for the governor's uh, approval. And that I, I know that that's already on. He also assured residents of Bayelsa State of his commitment to the existing peace and security of lives and properties in the state. Dobra Timiwood, Channel Television News. When the news at 10 returns, Central Bank of Nigeria to bar from using bank services exporters who fail to repatriate export proceeds in the country. That's on Business News. Do join us again. Over 850 billion naira is expected to be realized from the federal government's special trust fund for unclaimed dividends. The move to borrow from the unclaimed dividends, according to the Minister of Finance, is expected to shore up the nation's diverse sources of funding, the budget deficit, which is over 5 trillion naira, besides borrowing from domestic and external sources. But this move has generated debates amongst Nigerians who are asking the government to put a halt to the move. Concerns have continued to grow following the federal government's decision to securitize unclaimed dividends and dormant account balances of up to six years in the country. In the recently passed 2020 finance bill, the management of unclaimed dividends and dormant account balances have been captured as part of many other provisions intended by the federal government of Nigeria to mitigate the impact of fiscal downturn caused by the emergence of COVID-19. The funds realized will be placed in a trust fund managed by the Debt Management Office, whose responsibility also includes payments of claims for such dividends and the accompanying compensation for accrued interest. As far back as 2015, the Securities and Exchange Commission issued a circular directing company registrars to remit to the paying companies on claimed dividends held up for 15 months. Similarly, the Companies and Allied Matters Act of 1990, which was revised in 2020, provides that companies should publish the list of unclaimed dividends with names of all intended beneficiaries. Then the unclaimed dividends will be plowed back for investment purposes. According to the Securities and Exchange Commission, the total value of unclaimed dividends stood at 158.44 billion naira as at December of 2019. The Minister of Finance puts the expected figure of the Special Trust Fund at 850 billion naira. This is a special trust fund. It means government is keeping the money in trust for the beneficiaries. At any time, a registrar or a bank confirms that this is the true and bona fide beneficiary of this fund then government will release from that trust fund to the Nigerian that has that, to the investor that has that entitlement. Nevertheless, mixed reactions have trailed the plan to tap into the special trust fund in the face of the financial crunch encountered by government. There are various reasons why funds can be idle or dormant in an account. So um, that decision is going to bring a lot of confusion and a lot of uh, litigations. You know, because when a customer comes to a bank and requests for his money, whether it is dormant or not, he of, all he needs to do is just to activate it and he wants his money. And you tell him uh, government has borrowed such funds, it's going to bring a lot of problem. There's a 100% guarantee, if government borrows it, that it will be paid. If your money gets missing under a, a financial institution, you go to NDIC, you get only 50%. So it's even safer. 
And three, it's solving problems for the country because we are the cost to external borrowing. We have to do something about this. And this is one sure way of doing something about it by using the dormant resources that are hanging in the system to persecute development. So it makes sense. While concerns raised by some Nigerians include the ability of government to manage such funds effectively, considering that a lot of resources will need to be deployed, the initiative may just help to trigger the reactivation of dormant accounts of many banks, as well as encourage some others to retrieve their unclaimed dividends. The governor of Lagos State, Mr. Babajide Sonwolu, has commissioned a 110-bed maternal and child care centre, 252 public housing units, and flagged off the reconstruction hospital road in the Badagri area of the state. The governor says the projects are geared towards making the state a 21st century economy that will be beneficial to all residents. Governor Babajide Sonwolu makes his way to the Badagri area of Lagos to commission housing projects recently completed by the state government. Reducing the housing deficit is a priority for this administration and the Idale area of Badagri has 252 units of two-bedroom bungalows to show for it. This estate is the first green eco-friendly estate constructed by Lagos State. As part of this unique design, this estate comes with convenience of low-cost maintenance in terms of water usage and energy efficiency. The Dallas scheme is affordable and open to all. And even for the affordability, we want people to be able to pay over a longer period of time. You know, as a government, while we've been elected here is to make life easy and to make it comfortable for our citizens. We commissioned these two, two, two bedroom bungalows. Um, in a JV with Echo Stone and the Ministry of Housing. Thank you very much. The next port of call is the 110 bed maternal and child care centre, also in Badagri, designed to care for mother and child during pregnancy and after childbirth. It's built at a time when the state's healthcare sector is experiencing major infrastructure development. We've tried to separate the COVID activity from the general, secondary and primary health care functions of the state. And I'm happy to tell you that since the 24th of November, this place has been active. They've seen 3,000 outpatients, 600 of which have been children. They've had 49 normal deliveries and 50 cesarean sections. We're doing extensive renovation in three of our general hospitals. Because we're also in the C-19 era, which we call the COVID-19, the Lagos State will also be building for the future. So an infectious disease center will also come in up at the Infectious Disease Hospital, which is IDH in Yaba. And also, we're also planning to build a proper isolation center in Yaba. The governor ends his assignment for the day by flagging off the reconstruction of the 5.5-kilometer hospital road in Badagri local government area. The amalgamation house is, among other things, the location for the signing of the treaty which merged the northern and southern protectorates to make Nigeria one entity in 1914. The historic ceremony took place in Lord Frederick Lugard's office, located in Ikorabasi, then in Opoba Division, now in present Akwaibum State. Channels Television takes a look at the historic facility and captures its state today. History has it that Ikora Abasi, a local government area in Akwaibom State, was a major gateway into Nigeria apart from Lagos in the pre-colonial times. The community had a seaport through which some of the slave masters accessed the southern part of the country. This structure served as residence and office of Lord Frederick Lugard, who was the governor of both the Northern Nigeria Protectorate and the colony of the Protectorate of Southern Nigeria. He lived here with his spouse, Floral Shaw. This is where the Amalgamation Treaty was signed. Consequential artifacts have been left to corroborate history. 
The house is on elevated concrete pillars. It is a typical house of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It has a wide corridor supported by wooden pillars and big windows to cross-ventilate the offices. The whole structure is built with wood and corrugated iron sheets for the roof. The original roofing sheets are still here, but have turned dark brown with a good portion of it totally gone. A visitor must be careful to avoid slipping through the holes and sustaining injuries. Okay. Mama, be careful though, please, please. Here are the relics of Lord Lugard's office. His table, chair and his telephone are still here. Relics of old typewriter can be seen in this room that served as his secretary's office. A picture of Lord Lugard and spouse Flora Shaw is also here. The name Nigeria is said to have been coined by Ha. Some of the rooms are not accessible because of their poor state. The wood which serves as the floor is too weak to step on. A building, and this is a local government that actually, you know, hosted the signing, the treaty, signed Nigeria to become amalgamation in the days, um, the year 1914. So, ever since then, this local government has remained like that, and we're thinking uh, a lot should be done, you know, to revive, regenerate uh, these artifacts, and then see how to publicly, you know, project the rich tourism potentials of this part of the country. Directly opposite the amalgamation house is Lord Lugard's residence. It's a story brick building made up of three rooms, neglected and now occupied by animals. This building is surrounded by other brick buildings used by Lugard's domestic staff. This location also brings to mind the popular Aba women riot of 1929, where women protested ill treatment by the colonial masters. The 72-year-old women's rights activist takes us down memory lane. We can date it from 1925, when women in Calabar protested. And we can add the protests of women in Aba, but we must not forget the protests of women in Utue Temekbu. Women died. In Abak, here in Akwaibum State, women died. And then the climax that now forced the colonial masters to do something was here in Ikorobasi. And so if it's to be given a name or a title reflecting a location, it should be Ikorobasi Women's War. Other landmarks here include the Bridge of No Return, which served as the major hub for slave trade. In response to these appeals, the state government says it has initiated measures to save the sites from extinction. We've identified the location that, of course, it's not been... Um, you know, managed properly the way it should be. And then we're trying to also identify every artifact in the, at the location, you know, the originality of all of those items to be sure that, of course, these are items that were there since 1914. If restored, this site could, apart from preserving Nigeria's history, attract revenue through tourism and boost economic activities in the community and the state. Let's switch to some business now. Here's Teniola Shibuwale. Well, thanks a lot, Millicent. Welcome to Business News. Nigerian exporters who have not repatriated export proceeds will be prevented from all banking services with effect from January the 31st, and that's according to the Central Bank. In a statement released overnight on Friday, the CBN says the latest directive, which is part of its efforts to defend the Naira, applies to exports up until June last year. The financial markets regulator has also ordered banks to report exports 
exporters who failed to repatriate income earned abroad. Meanwhile, reports by Bloomberg mentions that a source at the CBN says proceeds for oil is to be repatriated within 90 days, while non-oil proceeds should be repatriated within 180 days. Last year, the Apex Bank ordered exporters to register through its online portal to ensure the repatriation of proceeds. Exports of Nigeria's key crude grade Kwaibo are set to resume for the first time in almost six weeks as its operator ExxonMobil has lifted a force majeure on the oil export terminal. This comes after a fire at the terminal halted production and loadings, shipping and trading on January the 22nd. The company has been under pressure since the closure while prices have been affected due to the disruption. Kwaibo is one of Nigeria's largest largest export grades and is very popular among global refiners with India, the United States, Canada, Italy, Spain, Indonesia and the Netherlands as its primary buyers. Nigeria's FX reserve sustained its accretion for the fifth consecutive week despite weak portfolio inflows. Latest data from the central bank shows that the external reserves grew by $133.79 million week on week to $36.48 billion as at January the 20th, and that is its highest level since June the 10th last year. The external reserves have increased by $1.09 billion since December the 31st, 2020 when it closed the year at $35.3 billion. Meanwhile, analysts say the country needs the reserves to hit $40 billion in order to adequately meet some demands which have piled up since 2020 when oil prices crashed. The Bears had the upper hand at the stock market this week as its dominance in four trading sessions led to a 0.42% drop on the all share index and 0.38% decline in equity capitalization. This comes after investors maintained intense sell pressure on some high value and mid cap stock, which led to a negative performance across all five key sector indexes of listed equities. The impact of profit taken affected the share price of 53 stocks, in particular Japan Gold, which emerged as number one on that list with a 37.50% loss. Champion Breweries is highest among 28 gainers, with more than 44% increase, while 79 equities remain unchanged. On the other hand, the total volume of shares traded this week was higher by more than 20% in contrast to last week's turnover, as 4.28 billion shares change hands for nearly 26 billion naira in over 32,800 transactions, led by the trio of Transcorp, Living Trust Insurance and Japol Gold. Well, let's move to the bond market where the central bank issued a total of 170 billion naira at the Omo Bills auction within the week. All tenors were oversubscribed, especially the 182 and 362 day papers, which were oversubscribed by 300 percent and 337.69 percent each, while the 103 day tenure was oversubscribed by 155 percent. On the other hand, the overall trade in session for the FGN bond market for the week was bearish for the week as the overall average benchmark yields closed at 3.44% with 6.42% increase week on week while sell interest was seen across all tenures. And that's business news tonight. I'm Tenyola La Shubawale. It's back to Millicent for the rest of the news at 10. Many thanks, uh, Teniola. And now to some sports news. Here's Kaya Day, Alaya Day. Hello and welcome to Sports News. Nigeria's CAF Confederation Cup representatives. Welcome to Sports News. Nigeria's CAF Confederation Cup representatives, Rivers United, have advanced to the final qualifying round of the competition after beating Bloemfontein Celtics of South Africa 3-0 in Benin Republic. 
Ravers United qualified 5-0 on aggregate after winning the first leg in Bloemfontein 2-0. Coach Stanley Eguma's side will now face Aimba in the final play of round. In the Nigeria Professional Football League, Kassina United and Plat United settled for a goalless draw in a keenly contested encounter played at the Mohamedou Diko Stadium. Both sides gave their all, but the encounter failed to produce a goal. The match day six fixture is the only game to be played today. And staying with football, Southampton has not defending champions Arsenal out of the FA Cup in the fourth round courtesy of a first half own goal. The Saints were rewarded for their attacking intent in the opening period when Gabriel turned in Kyle Walker Peters' cross in the 24th minute. Southampton will face another Premier League side Wolves in the next round. And in other matches, Brighton beat Blackpool 2-1, while Sheffield United beat Plymouth Argyle by the same scoreline. Elsewhere, Swansea beat Nottingham Forest 5-1 to advance. West Ham also booked the spot in the next round with a 4-0 victory over Doncaster Rovers. And in the last game of the day, Manchester City beat Cheltenham 3-1. That will be all on Sports News. Back to you, Melissa. Thank you, Kayade. And on the international scene, Larry King, giant of US broadcasting, who achieved worldwide fame for interviewing political leaders and celebrities, has died at the age of 87. King conducted an estimated 50,000 interviews in his six-decade career, which included 25 years as host of the popular CNN talk show, Larry King Live. Death is something people don't From like. his beginnings on local about. radio and in Miami like to his popular CNN yes, series, uh, Larry King I Live, King sat across the table it, uh, from every sitting U.S. president, right. from Gerald but Ford, that, uh, and a number of world Lord leaders, right. including and Nelson Mandela. Those orders are us uh, to stand at the gate there because of the crowd. And, uh, well, what were you thinking as you walked? No, I was thinking, of course, of freedom. Millions watched CNN's Larry King live show, Welcome. which ran from 1985 to 2010. He made his show one of the network's prime attractions, with a mix of interviews, political discussions, current event debates, and phone calls from viewers. In a career spanning six decades and over 50,000 interviews, he won countless awards, including the Peabody Award for Excellence in Broadcasting. I'm, I'm very proud to have uh, I've been in this business, still in, going to be doing other things. I can't leave it. I couldn't retire. But having this is certainly, uh, I've gotten some pretty good awards. This ranks up with the best of them. The talk show host, famous for his braces and rolled up sleeves, had faced several health problems in recent years, including heart attacks. Earlier this month, he had been treated for COVID-19, but no official cause of death has been announced. I, I, am, I don't know what to say except to you, my audience. Thank you. And instead of goodbye, how about so long? He will always be remembered. To all the stories, Italian Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte says a delay in the supply of coronavirus vaccines from Pfizer and AstraZeneca is unacceptable. Both companies have warned they will not be able to deliver vaccines to the EU as agreed due to production issues. Prime Minister Conte has accused them of serious contract violations and warns that he would take legal action. A senior Italian health official has warned that the country will have to rethink its vaccination program if supply issues continue. Several other European countries have also been affected. The EU Health Commissioner has expressed deep dissatisfaction at the delay. 
Thousands of people in Hong Kong have been ordered to stay at home in the city's first coronavirus lockdown. Authorities say about 10,000 people living in buildings in a restricted area of the Kowloon Peninsula must stay at home until they have all been tested. They are aiming to finish the process of testing everyone within about 48 hours so that people can return to work on Monday. The move comes amid a surge in coronavirus cases in the area. And the main news again, residents of Agbo in Delta State were today thrown into mourning after four people died in a gas explosion in the area. The blast also left 11 other people severely burnt with Governor Fire Kawa vowing to regulate the siting of gas stations within residential areas in the state. Also today, Nigeria pledged $100 million in a renewed effort by ECOWAS leaders to tackle insecurity in the sub-region. The decision was made known at the virtual 58th Ordinary Session of the Heads of State. Last you heard, Italian Prime Minister Mr. Conte today warned that he will take legal action against Pfizer and AstraZeneca over delay in the supply of coronavirus vaccines. Well, that's news at 10 tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Minister Walker. Have a good night. Stay safe. Stay healthy.